chapter four, which is all about uh, graphs. And so we want to look at 4.3 today. In 4.1, we introduced the idea of making a graph of the trigonometric functions like sine and cosine, looking at the basic trig functions um, and the, how their graphs look. And then in 4.2, um, we continued looking at graphs. And by the end of those two sections, we wanted to have an idea of these basic graphs and how to perhaps change or modify the graph by multiplying the function or the argument by a number or by adding or subtracting from the function or the argument a number and how that caused things like the amplitude to change or the period to change all of these things we introduced and that how you might have a shift or a sort of a um, a scaled change, like a multiplier that would either stretch or shrink the graph, or an add that would cause the graph to ship up or down or shift left or right or something like that. And so that's a lot. I actually think those two sections are very challenging. That's a lot of information. It really depends on how comfortable students were with graphing after leaving algebra. Did your algebra teacher do a good amount of graphing of parabolas and shifting and scaling parabolas, or did they kind of skip over that part? So, um, but nonetheless, uh, we are continuing to look at graphing. So in 4.3, we're going to look at the other functions other than sine and cosine. So we're going to look uh, specifically at the graph of the tangent function. And then of course we have the other co-functions like cotangent, um, which is the reciprocal of tangent. And we're going to further discuss some techniques of graphing and trying to keep in mind the connection between the picture of a function's graph and a, an equation that might generate that picture as well. All right, so we're gonna start with the tangent function. And so as we begin to consider the graph of a tangent function, we have to introduce something called a vertical asymptote. So let's get some color here. So here's this definition of a vertical asymptote here. And that's a vertical line that the graph approaches, but does not intersect. As the X values get closer and closer to the line, the function values increase or decrease without bound. So uh, before we look at how that shows up in our trig functions, I'd like to look at a simple example of a function that I can show you to get a sense of this. Um, so let's say that we're going to imagine a graph. Let's see if I can do that here. And let's say I want to graph the function one divided by x. So we could, again, think about producing a graph by just plotting some points. I can make a table here of x values and what the function would give me. And so if I imagine plugging in some numbers like maybe a one or a two or a three. I'm gonna make a quick, quick, probably pretty lousy sketch of a graph here. So for example, if I plug in a one, then one divided by one is just one. So that plots a point on the graph, which would be right here. If I plug in a two for X, then I would have one over two or one half, which would be lower like that. If I plug in a three, then I would get one third. And that goes on like that. However, if I plug in some small numbers into the function, then some interesting things happen. Oops. For example, if instead of plugging in a one or a two or a three, I plug in a one half, 
if I plug in one half and then I'm supposed to do one over X, that would be one over one half. And when you have a little fraction you're dividing by, the classical way to fix that is to multiply in the top and the bottom by a number to get rid of that fraction. And I would get rid of one half by multiplying it by two. And so this ends up being that I get uh, two over one, which is two. Basically, what does the F function do when you have one over X? It flips the number. It makes the reciprocal, the flip of the number. And if I flip a one half, I get two over one, which is two. If I flip one third, I get three. If I flip one tenth, I get 10. So what's happening is as I plug in small little numbers for X that are getting closer and closer to zero, one tenth, one hundredth, one thousandth, one millionth, and I flip those, I get 10, a hundred, a thousand, a million. At one half, I get a two. At one third, I get a three. And so this is what this curve looks like. And it actually does the exact same thing in the negative direction, because if any of these X inputs were negative, well, then I would get the exact same outputs, but also negative. That's called symmetric with respect to the origin. And so I would also get a curve over here that's kind of looking the same, but down in the negative side. So this is a, um, a fairly simple function because all it does is flip whatever you number you give it. But what you can see with this function is that it's an example where you have a value, in this case, zero, where X cannot be equal to that number because it would make this function undefined. I can't take one and divide it by zero. But that as you get little teeny numbers that close, get closer and closer to zero, the values of the function themselves increase or decrease without bound. They basically head off to some sort of infinity. So as the X values come in closer and closer to zero, the values of the functions shoot off to positive infinity on the right and negative infinity on the left. And so this is an illustration of when you have a vertical asymptote, but they're saying the vertical asymptote is a vertical line that the graph approaches but does not intersect. So what is the vertical asymptote in this case? It's the y-axis. It's this vertical line that's the y-axis. And usually asymptotes are often drawn with a dashed line like this. And so this is the line x equals zero. Vertical lines have a fixed x value. And this vertical line of x equals zero is a vertical asymptote for the function one over x. Now, the reason they're introducing this idea of a vertical asymptote, this vertical line where X is fixed at a particular value in which the function doesn't really actually contact the line because there's no, it does not intersect the line. And also as you get closer to the line, the picture of the function is shooting off to infinity in one direction or another. The reason we're introducing this now is because these show up a lot with the graphs of the co-functions. Basically, having a zero value in the denominator of a fraction often produces a vertical asymptote. And so if you have a function like the tangent function, which is sine of theta over cosine of theta or of x or whatever, well, that means that whenever the cosine in the bottom of that fraction is zero, the function will be undefined. And in this case, when that happens, as you get closer to that zero value of the bottom, you get the fraction going off to a positive or a negative infinity or something like, like this function that we're looking at here with one over x. 
So that's the idea about a vertical asymptote and why we're talking about it now as we're about to see those show up with the graphs of like the tangent function and stuff. Questions, comments, discussions about that at all? All right, so maybe you can think about this, this example of a vertical asymptote at the line, the up and down line x equals zero, the y-axis, with this function one over x, where you just flip the number. Maybe that'll give you something you can try to relate to, as opposed to something more complicated like sine over cosine or something like that. All right, well, here they're gonna just give you a, the idea of this function in a nutshell. So we're going to look at the f of x equals tan x function. And remember, tan of x is equal to sine of x over cosine of x. And so what they're, what's going on with this is you could plug in numbers from our tables of values that are simple to plug into sine and cosine like zero, pi over four, pi over two, things like that. And so they, they have this table over here on the left where for each of those numbers, you could say, like, let's say I take pi over four, you could just think, all right, if X is equal to pi over four, then the tan function would be sine of pi over four divided by the cosine of pi over four. And since these are numbers that we're getting used to being able to look up easily or remember, sine of pi over four is square root of two over two. Cosine of pi over four is also square root of two over two. And the fraction with the same thing in the top and the bottom would become one. And therefore the tangent of that angle is one. And of course we have all of these for the tangent function specifically in tables of values and things like that. But what that would mean is that if I'm drawing a graph of the tangent function, when x is equal to pi over four, like here on this graph, I would go up and plot a point when we're at one and I would get a point on the graph. When I plug in a zero, sine of zero is zero, cosine is one. So I would get, when I plug in a zero, I get a zero. So it goes to the origin. But as we get closer to pi over two, we, we've stated before that the tan function is undefined there. But what we now wanna recognize is the reason it's undefined is that the denominator is becoming close to zero, like with the one over x function. When the denominator values get closer and closer to zero, it causes the fraction of those to become very large. So what happens here is that the function shoots up off toward positive infinity as the x values get closer and closer to pi over two. And the same thing in the negative direction, the, ta the tan function here, like the one over x function is symmetric with respect to the origin. And so what's happening on the positive right side also happens on the negative left side as we approach negative pi over two. And so it's good to use a graphing utility for something like this as well. Um, and so we can see here, they're showing us a window that looks like from some sort of a TI calculator. And we do also know that the tan function um, has a period where it repeats of every pi. And so that's why you can see this, this one shape where the right side goes to infinity and the left side goes down to negative infinity, it repeats like there's one here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here, and it repeats every period of pi. And we can see here they've drawn one period of pi. And the pi of repetition that they've shown here is the values between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. So that's one period of the tan function. And then it just keeps doing that every time you move over another cycle of pi. And that means you have a whole bunch of these um, vertical asymptotes along the way. All right, so let's, as a reminder, since graphing is very challenging, let's remind ourselves that we can also hop over to like Desmos if we like. <laughs> 
and we can just put in like y equals tan of x and just see what happens. And here we get that same repeating function that repeats every pi. Of course, they don't have the nice pi values like pi over four and things like that labeled. But we can see that sort of the repetition and you can see this infinite behavior here. Like if I go way up here and keep going up, notice that the graph just keeps going up and up and up and up and up and up. You can scale around and look. So it's kind of interesting that way. Okay, so, and of course, like the sine function and the cosine function, we wanna be able to think about creating graphs of these over one period or two periods or something. And also what would happen if we modified these graphs? So we're about to look at say, well, what if I multiplied the tan of the X in the argument of tan by a number? And we're gonna see the exact same things happen that we saw with sine and cosine. So let's try to remind ourselves of that for a second. If I multiply the X argument by a number like two, it causes the period to divide by two. So if I put in a two here, we see that all of a sudden the period now has, has shrunk inward. And now the function is repeating more frequently. I take out the two and then I put in the two and notice that the whole thing just kind of gets steeper and you have more recurrences of that function. Similarly, if I put in one half or 0 0.5, then it will stretch and make the period get um, bigger. Instead of a period of pi, I now have a period of two pi. And so playing with this on a nice graphing utility makes this a lot easier to do. Similarly, as we saw in um, 4.2, I could add a number to the function and it will shift the graph up. Like if I put in a three, then all of those curves just lifted up three spaces. They used to the middle one used to go through the origin here and now it lifted up and now it goes through three when you're at when x is zero. Or if instead I make it go down by three, then all of a sudden that point that went through the origin now goes through uh, negative three and all of the curves just drop down by three spaces. Similarly, if I take the x argument, let's put that in parentheses, and I add one to the x value, then all of those points on the graphs have now shifted left by one unit. It used to be at the origin, now I'm, now that middle spot is at negative one zero, it's shifted to the left. Or if instead I make that go to the right, by I can do that by subtracting from the x value. Now that middle point is shifted over to the right by one unit. So the graphing utility is a great way for us to not only explore the original functions themselves, but also to explore what happens to the graph when you modify it by multiplying or adding a number either inside the argument or outside of the function. So notice they have this not very friendly little graph here, and we can make a much nicer graph that's very easy to manipulate on something like Desmos. So they're gonna to try to point out some of the properties of the tangent graph. The graph is discontinuous at values of X of the form, and they give this kind of weird form to try to express it. And that's kind of like the weird form that they gave for sort of the, the repeating periods of, of functions as well. But when they say 2n plus 1, that's just their way of saying any odd number of pi over 2. Because if n is a 0, you have a 1. If n is a 1, you have a 3. If n is a 2, you have a 5. So this is like x equals pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2 etc. And any of these could be negative numbers as well. 
And so those are the places where the graph is discontinuous because those are the places where cosine is zero. And since tangent is sine of x over cosine of x, these are the values where cosine is zero. And that makes the fraction therefore discontinuous because it's undefined there. And they're saying that's where all of these vertical asymptotes will take place. So not only does the function become undefined at these values, but if you plug in closer and closer values to pi over two or three pi over two, or any of these discontinuous places, as you plug in numbers close to those values, the value of the fraction goes off to positive infinity or negative infinity. Just like the one over x function that I, I looked at at the beginning. Now, all the zero values of the tan function, since the top of the fraction has sine x in it for the tan function, well, then the zero values of that fraction would be all the zero values of the sine function, which are the multiples of pi. 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi. So if you remember for the sine function, it has this repeating wave. At 0, it hits 0. At pi, it hits 0. At 2 pi, it hits 0. And it just keeps doing that. Well, then at all those places where the sine function hits 0, those are also places where the tan function hits 0. And we can see that here. And so that would be here's a zero, there's a zero on this little graph, all of these places. So this is pi, this is two pi, as it shows here. This is zero, this is minus pi. All multiples of pi are gonna be where the tan function crosses the x-axis, just like those are the places where the sine function crosses the x-axis. The period is pi, which we tried to, I tried to illustrate up here. You can see here that that's the width between this repeating behaviors, that this period is pi. And we kind of knew that from before when we looked at just the periods of the trigonometric functions that just repeats after every cycle of pi. But graphically, that means you're going to get the same shape repeating on the graph. Now, here's something more interesting to contrast with the sine and the cosine. Its graph has no amplitude. It has a period, but it has no amplitude since there are no minimum or maximum values. So the sine and cosine functions, we can think of this height here as the amplitude, the, 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 the gap or the distance from the middle line of the function to the very top, or also the same size from the middle of the function to the very bottom. So that was the amplitude for sine or cosine, but this function doesn't have a top or a bottom. It just keeps going up off toward infinity. And so for that reason, it has no amplitude, unlike the sine and cosine. And as they do mention here, which is again, something we're trying to get comfortable with, it's symmetric with respect to the origin. So we looked at that briefly. That's also true for the sine function. And it basically means if I plug in a value into the tan function and I change the sign of my input, I get the same answer that just changes the sign. So for example, if I plug in pi over four, I get one. And if I switch to negative pi over four, then I get negative one. And so whatever positive value I plug in, it gives me an answer. The negative of that value will give me the negative of that same answer which we've sort of seen this on the table of values before. What a big mess on this screen I've created. All right, so these are properties that we learn about as we see this graph regularly, as we think about it, as we try to modify it, we'll, we'll continue to look at these ideas. So what about cotangent? So cotangent is one over tangent. Tangent is sine over cosine. So we want to remember then that cotangent is cosine over sine. So basically all of those ideas of the fraction and the zeros in the top or the zeros in the bottom and all of that, 
All of those discussions are exactly the same for cotangent, but we're just flipping everything. So now it used to be with tangent that everywhere sine was zero, tangent was zero, pi, two pi, three pi. But now that sine is in the bottom of the fraction with cotangent, then everywhere where sine is zero, all of a sudden cotangent is now undefined. So in our little picture here, we see at pi, instead of hitting a zero when we get to pi, we have an undefined place. And therefore, the function is shooting off to an infinity. It's shooting off to negative infinity as we approach pi from the left. And if we were thinking about getting close to pi from the right, that was a little bigger than pi, it would be going up this way to positive infinity. The other function, tangent, was undefined whenever cosine x was zero, like pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two. That's where all the vertical asymptotes were. But now that cosine is in the top of the fraction, those are all the places where you get the zero values of the function. Pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two. And graphically, you can compare the cotangent function with the tangent function by just imagining that it's just kind of sort of flipped around. So here's tan of x, and then we can see they graphed cotan of x. And we can kind of see it's the same idea, the same shape, you have the asymptotes, but it's been flipped around. And of course, for the tangent, just in terms of the shape and the tangent function, would have happened at the origin instead of here. So it's been moved over from the origin. So the tan function would have been doing through the origin, would have been going like that. And let me draw this in better. So instead, that tan function has been slid over to the right. And then it's been kind of flipped upside down. So imagine you took the tan function, slid it to the right by pi over two, and then you reversed it upside down, then you would get the cotan function. In fact, we can do those things. So you can think of the fact that cotan of x is actually going to be equal to the tan of x function and I could shift it to the right by subtracting pi over two. And I could flip it upside down by putting a minus in front of it. So the cotan x function is actually, actually the same as minus the tan x, uh, the tan of x minus pi over two. Those are the same thing. Just to show you how much these functions are related to each other, one can actually think thought of as a translation and a flip of the other one. Questions about that at all? And if you don't want to make a nasty sketch like this and you want to compare the two, or even see how one becomes the other, you can type these easily into Desmos or anything else and then compare the graphs and see how they translate. All right, so that's cotangent. Properties of cotangent, well, it's really just a modified tangent graph. So it's going to have the same period, period is still pi, and what used to be the discontinuous values of tangent are now the x-intercepts of cotangent, the odd multiples of pi over two. And what used to be the x-intercepts of tangent are now the discontinuities of cotangent. Its graph also has no amplitude because it goes off to these infinities. It's also symmetric with respect to the origin. So it has a lot of similarities with the, the tangent function. 
So it says that the function can be graphed directly with the graphing calculator using a tangent key, but it says sometimes to graph the cotangent function, you have to write it as the reciprocal or the flip of the tangent function because you may be working with a calculator that actually doesn't have a cotangent button separately. So they're just trying to help you, just depending on which calculator you're using to do this. Most of the now nowadays more powerful graphing utilities, it's very easy to graph cotangent. But it's always just the flip of the tangent function if that's helpful for you when considering making the graphs. All right, so how would we sketch one of these things? And well, why do we need help and sketch one of these things? Only when we have these multipliers come in, for example, that would change the period. Now, the amplitude can no longer change. It's always going off to infinities on both ends. There is no max and min, but the period could change and that's gonna affect how quickly it replicates. And even if you don't change the amplitude, the numbers themselves might get stretched up or down. For example, with the tan function, go way back up here. With the tan function, when I plug in pi over four, I'm at a one here. But if I were to take the tan function and say multiply it by two and put a big two out front, well then instead of being a one, it would jump up to being at a two. So then the graph would be going up here to two and would kind of be going up and down more quickly. So it is still going to sort of stretch the graph away from the x-axis. You just won't see a bump and a peak that's obvious that goes up to a higher point, but still every point on the graph does get lifted up to a higher position when you multiply all the y values by two, as an example. So multiplying the function by a number, just like sine and cosine, will stretch the function up and down by a factor of that number. And multiplying the x value by a number will divide the period by that number, also just like the sine and the cosine. So they're discussing that here to talk about how that will modify and affect the graph if you're trying to graph one of these functions that's been multiplied or divided by a number somewhere. And so they're showing here, maybe there's an A out front that would cause a change in the Y direction, or maybe there's a B in here with the argument with the X that would change the period. You would divide the period by B uh, in the case of B times X, for example. So they go through this four-step process. And then they say, well, what if you were going to graph y equals tan of two times x? So in this case, we are looking at this idea where it says, well, when is it that tan would have had a vertical asymptote at pi over two? And so if I, take that pi over two, and I now let two x be equal to that, and I solve for x, I now get pi over four plus or minus. And this has the same result as before. If the period was pi over two, then you would take the period and divide it by this multiplier here, or that's pi over two times one half, or pi over four. So you can kind of see it in this solving process that they show here, but really what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the old period and just divide by that number. So if you had pi over two and you divide that by two, it then becomes pi over four. So in terms of the graph, if you used to have your vertical asymptotes out here, well then you shift them inward to the new vertical asymptotes and that's reducing. So before you had a period of pi, and now your new period has been divided by two so that you're down to pi over two. And the vertical asymptotes themselves went from pi over two to pi over four as we were just discussing in this uh, slide here for how to adjust the asymptotes. So the period gets divided by 
that multiplier by whatever that number is that's a multiplier. The period gets divided by that number, and that also causes the values of the vertical asymptotes to get divided by that number as well. So with that new place, we can then say, all right, well, before when we were at pi over four, we were up at one. Before we were here, pi over four was at one. Well, that gets shifted in also by a factor of two. That gets moved this way. So now we have to be at pi over eight. We would take all the points where things happened before and divide them by two to see the new points where they happen to make the new graph. So now these, they call them the quarter values. The first quarter value used to be pi over four. That shifts to pi over eight and negative pi over eight as well. And so then what you end up seeing is that the, it's really the same graph, the same shape, except it's kind of been made skinnier because it's been squished in as the period has shrunk. And so it's not stretched out over as big a period as it was. It's the period's been cut in half or divided by two. And so now it happens it more quickly, basically. And so, and the graph could continue as well if we wanted. And so we modify the graph of the tangent function basically the same way we'd modify the graph of a sine and cosine function as we discussed in the first two sections of this chapter. But the graph looks different. There's no amplitude now. So you have to kind of look at points. So instead of looking the top of the sine curve, that maximum bump and see where that gets stretched to, you have to pick sort of a key point. Like for example, the key point would have been pi over four comma one, and then imagine what happens to that point. So in this case, that point got moved from pi over four to pi over eight because we modified the x value. If I multiplied the tan function by something outside, that would modify the one and move it up to a two or down, depending on what you multiplied by. So now they're doing both things. Now they're saying, all right, we're multiplying by a negative three outside the function. And in the argument next to x, we're multiplying by a one half. So I will say the same things for these that I did back in the earlier work. Each of these has an effect. So this means the period. gets divided by one half or equivalently multiplied by two. And when you multiply the function by negative three, then it would have been, you would say the amplitude grew by three, but you can say that it's sort of stretched in the y direction, meaning vertically up or down, by three, and because the number is negative, we would say flipped upside down. Again, the reason multiplying by negative flips it upside down is because all the positive values get sent down to be negative values, and all the negative values get sent up to be positive values when you multiply by a negative, so that causes the entire graph to flip upside down. And in this case, also grow by a factor of three. So it will increase the up and down values of all points by a factor of three. There's no amplitude to help demonstrate that. So we have to think of a nice point like pi over four, one, where does that, where does that value go, for example? So they say, consider like an interval that you would have graphed over and imagine cutting that into parts to sort of imagine where things get moved and how things get changed to get key x values and evaluate the new function at those x values. So instead of getting a one, you're getting a three or a negative three, et cetera, et cetera. So here they have the graph plotted as the result. So let's compare 
of how we could see this being a result of the modifications that I just pointed out. That's not very straight. Let's try that one more time. A little better. Oh, that's tilted. Anyway, all right. So normally our graph, as we were just looking at before, would have a vertical asymptote when x was at pi over two, and another one over here at negative pi over two, and it would look like this. And a key point at pi over four would be at one. And at negative pi over four, it will be down at negative one. And so what we were saying, what I was saying was, is that if we consider that we have this one half here in front of the X, that means you're going to double the size of the period. So that's gonna send it out this way. So the vertical asymptote, instead of being at pi over two, got moved out to being at pi, twice as far out. And this one, everything gets stretched in this direction. And the vertical asymptotes are a good place to start to see that. Then instead of this key point here happening at pi over four, it's gonna now happen at pi. That's gonna be shifted over as well but it's also going to be shifted by a factor of three and get flipped upside down. So I could imagine doing those two things. Well, if I move it over and up to a factor of three, it would come up here at three. And so now I would have a graph that sort of went through this point as it went out to that uh, asymptote out there. I didn't double that very well, did I? No, I did not. So it would go up like this and down like that. And then I have to turn that whole thing upside down. And that's how we end up with the graph that they have there. So notice you have the, the point that was originally here at pi over four one is now down here at pi over two and it got shoved down to negative three. And our asymptotes got moved out to the side. And then instead of going up to positive infinity on the right, we don't now go down to negative infinity on the right because the whole graph got turned upside down. So you can try to think of each of these uh, effects of multiplying in the argument or multiplying by the function and how they would affect the graph and then how you can put those things together to see the new graph. As I was demonstrating, uh, the Desmos or some other graphing calculator that you can modify quickly and easily will make it much easier to see these changes in action as they do them for you. But you do want to try to work out in your mind how these actions cause an effect on the graph that you started with. All right, let's see how we go here. So there's a note. The function defined by minus 3 tan 1 half x has a graph that compares to the graph of tan x as follows. The period is larger because b being 1 half was less than 1. And when you multiply in the argument by a number less than 1, it makes the period larger. When you multiply by a number bigger than 1, it makes the period smaller. And since we don't have an amplitude to talk about being changed, as I was trying to describe, the graph is stretched in the up and down or vertical direction because A was negative three and the absolute value of that is bigger than one. So that's gonna make the function go outward in the vertical direction, higher up and higher down than it did before. And the negative part also makes it in this case, turn upside down. So it's nice for them to try to summarize. I was trying to do that all along the way, but hey, they have a note to try to do that as well. Each branch of the graph falls from left to right, um, meaning the function is going down as you look across the graph from left to right. And that's because it got turned upside down where the original tangent graph went up from left to right. And so that's the negative aspect of the 
of the multiplier that was outside of the tangent. And so then they give you one using the cotangent as another example. All the steps are the same. All the modifications are the same. Again, you can also just type this into a graphing calculator to, to try to see what it ends up with and compare. And then they end up with this modified version of the cotangent as well. So in this case, they didn't flip it upside down because most of the numbers are positive. So it still decreases from left to right, but they changed the scale and stretched the period as needed. Or in this case, this part would cause the period to be divided by two. And this part would cause the vertical stretching to actually be a compression. So that instead of the normal place where the point hit a one, it now only goes up to one half. And so we can see those modified points here and here, that they're at the one half level instead of at the one level. And that instead of going out to pi, we're now only going out to pi over two here, so that our new, our new, um, our new period is only pi over two. It's half as big as what it used to be. So by sort of looking at these happen and summing up these kind of results, you get an idea of how to modify the original function with the multipliers that were put in there, just as we did with sine and with cosine. All right, so let's see if we could take a quick look at the um, homework and see if some of the problems become doable with this understanding. All right, so let's say I was going to take a peek at the first part of our assignment that's due for this weekend on, uh, well, let's look at the practice problems for four, three. Look at them five, let's see what we get. All right, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. That helps, I think. There we go, just to make it more legible for everybody. So it says graph the function. Graph the function over one, a one period interval. And the one they're giving us is y equals five times tan of x. So the tan of x function basically looks like this. It goes through the middle here, through the origin. It has a period of pi. And so we want to see which one of these would make sense. Now, you could just toss this onto Desmos and try to match it with one of these pictures. You can also make these pictures bigger by clicking on the open a new max window or scaling it up here to get a better view of the graph, if that helps you. But Hopefully these problems will be something you could do by just imagining what change would this cause? For example, if I multiply by a five on the outside of the function, that doesn't change the period at all. So we would still have the same asymptotes, which we do see here look like they're the same. Pi over two and negative pi over two are the same vertical asymptotes as for the regular tan function. And that's basically true for all of these graphs. So that part makes sense. So then the question would be, well, what would happen to the key value? So if I make this bigger, the key value would normally be at pi over four, and normally you would get a one. But now, because we're multiplying tangent by five, when I'm at pi over four, I should be up at a five. And that's where I'm at on this first graph here. If I, well, the second graph, has been flipped upside down. So I know it's not that one. But what if I look at C? That has pi over two and negative pi over two. But what we see with C is that when we went to the pi over four value, it's got a teeny little value. I think what they did is they did it by one fifth to see if you chose to divide by five. But if I take tan of pi over four and get a one and multiply it by five, it should be up at the five value, not down at this teeny value. And this one also has a teeny value and it's been flipped upside down. So it might be that without even having to use Desmos or some other graphing calculator, just by understanding what happens when you multiply by five, you can pick the correct choice here on the homework assignment. All right, let's take a look at another one. Maybe uh, lucky number seven. Well, let's go up to number 10. Let's advance a little bit more. 
So now it says graph the function over a two period interval and all the choices have two periods. So we're gonna pick from one of those. But what we're supposed to find out is which one was three X plus pi, three X plus pi. So we have a couple of things going on in here that are a little bit more confusing. So I think this is a good one for us to look at. And we got what, five minutes? Yeah, that'll be good for us to finish this challenge. So as we did when we have a multiplier in here and a shift in the graph with sine and cosine, is you want to do the shift first and the multiplier second. And that means that we need to have the multiplier factored out, which they did not do here. So here's the way I would suggest you imagine trying to rewrite this. And the book gave us a format for this as well. Is I would want to take this 3x plus pi and I would want to factor the 3 out of both of these. So I'm going to think of this as 3 times x plus 3 times and to be left with pi, I would be multiplying by pi over three. So if I multiply three times pi over three, I just get pi. So these two are the equivalent to those. But by writing pi as three times pi over three, I can factor out this common three from both of these. And so then I can consider this being like having tan of three times x plus pi over three, using some algebra there. And this was recommended for um, translations where you have a multiplier also, because now we can see that this number will affect the period and this number will make a, a shift to try to pick the correct graph. Let's see if I can close that, leave that there, there we go. So now if we're looking at these, we want the tan function, but instead of going from like pi over two to negative pi over two for the root function, I now want to take that period and divide it by three. So now instead it's going to go from pi over six to negative pi over six. And that looks like that happens uh, in A or C. Because what I can see here when I look at A, for example, is that now we're going from negative pi over six to positive pi over six instead of pi over two and pi over two. Now the function has been shifted by to the left by pi over three. Well, that means the zero value would get shifted to the left or from here to the right by pi over three, which would actually end up exactly where we have where the pi over three is the other zero value when you did a shift. So if I go over here to perhaps um, D, no, C is the other one that has pi over six and minus pi over six. Where is it? Pi over three, where's the one? I thought there was another one with pi over six. That actually looks like the only one that has pi over six choices. Oh, this one has sort of also a period of that same amount. Whoops, I didn't mean to select that. Let's go here. So if we're looking at this one, then the shift is pi over six instead of pi over three. Also, the tan function has been turned upside down. So I think with each of these others, you'll be able to figure out some reason why it doesn't match with what's supposed to happen so that we can choose the correct one of having a shift of power three to the left and a period that was reduced by a factor of three or divided by three. <laughs>